live. So good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from everyone. My name is Jesse and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure and science into classrooms around the world. And we are really excited because this is February and February for us has always meant that we kick out all the men and welcome in only incredible women dedicating the entire month to incredible women in science and exploration from around the globe from over 20 countries with over 50 sessions this month. So thank you so much for being a part of our special festivities. Right now, we've got two classes joining us live. We had a whole bunch of cancellations with a big blanket of snow across Ontario, and that's what happens when you have four of your five classes in a day being from Southern Ontario. Um, so I want to give our classes that are here a huge thank you for joining in and a chance to do a bit of a shout out. So we've got Mr. Duggins, grade nines in Toronto, Ontario. Hi guys. Hi, of course. Probably some sort of environmental oh, science. Coming in. Oh, they're just for in either. <laughs> well, there have to be some sort of technical these. Hi, Mr. Duggan's class, welcome in. And then Miss Gruss's class and you Cyrus in Kansas, they are grade fives. Their audio isn't working. So again, all the tech difficulties today keeps it very exciting. Of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. So we are joined live in Finland by Maria Trevino. She is a boreal forest ecologist at the Boreal Ecosystems Research and Research Group there in Finland. And so she's gonna walk through with us today how, how management of boreal forests, which is an ecosystem that some of us know and love uh, very well here in Canada, uh, managing those boreal forests affects the ecosystem services they can provide. So when humans get involved, how do these forests change? What happens with them? What happens to them um, with regards to the organisms that call them home? So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Maria. Thank you so, so much for joining us today, all the way from Finland, and take it away. Hi, thank you very much for the introduction and the opportunity uh, for having me today and having the opportunity to talk about a bit the work that we do in this part of the, of the work and to explain how cool our boreal forest. And I have prepared a few slides. I will try to share them now with you. I hope it works well. It's got to. <laughs> yes. Together we'll make it work. So now. Perfect. It's great. Perfect. Okay, great. So, yeah, I will talk today about a uh, boreal forest, uh, also known as taiga, and why they are so important and some of the threats that they are facing nowadays, and also the a bit of the work that, that we are doing here in Finland. Hi, everyone. I'm Maria. Uh, it's really nice to meet you all. Um, I'm originally from Spain, where I did a degree in environmental science. And since I'm a teenager, I have been really concerned and interested in the, the problems that Earth is facing, like uh, the pollution of oceans or the destruction of forests and nature and the high rate of extinction of species. And uh, after my degree, I was working for a bit. I moved to England. I studied marine science there. And then I moved back to, um, to Spain. I continued studying and I did a doctorate in ecology where I studied um, how climate change was affecting the distribution of birds in Spain and Portugal. And then I was looking for a job and I got a job in Finland. Uh, here is in Europe, uh, in the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, and Finland is like the farthest country away from Spain. Uh, it's very culturally different also. So every time that I want to come back to visit family and friends, it takes around like 12 hours. And here is also a picture of the beautiful campus. I'm today working and uh, from the University of Uvascula and where I have been working for the last seven years, uh, studying how uh, how can we manage the boreal forest to not only provide the economic value or like from the timber, but how can we manage that it will also provide a, like a suitable habitat for species and other benefits that I will explain later on. Uh, yeah, I, I'm part of this boreal ecosystem research group. And here is a picture, a couple of pictures of my past and current uh, colleagues and team members. I feel really uh, grateful to work with such talented and, and great colleagues and friends. And uh, I want to emphasize that maybe that's one of the things that I love more from being in science is that the working environment is really nice and uh, internationally diverse. 
And it's really important in, in science to do collaborations because of course you cannot know everything by yourself. So that's really important. So forest uh, cover around 30% of the earth terrestrial surface. And uh, the main three types are tropical, temperate and boreal forest. And this classification is based to the distance to the equator. Uh, boreal forests are located uh, in the northern part of the, of the globe in latitudes around 50 uh, to 70 degrees north. And just to keep uh, some in mind, like New York, for example, is only like 40 degrees north. This is uh, a picture from uh, the North Pole, how the globe looked like, and the green area is where boreal forests are located. They are really important as they cover around one third of the remaining forest. It, that means like over 16 million square meters. And as they are very close to the North Pole, they have very harsh and really cold conditions. Um, the summers are really short and with very long days and the winters are really long uh, and with very short days. For example, here in Yubascula, but I guess that if you are joining from Canada, maybe you have similar conditions, but here in Yubascula in December, it's only like five hours of sunlight. Uh, and even if you go a bit northern in Lapland, uh, where Santa Claus is living, the sun is not even rising at all for about two months. And that makes that the forests are growing quite slow and uh, there are only few tree species um, and most of the tree species are ever, evergreen, which means that they keep their uh, leaves for the, throughout the whole year. And here are some of the countries where, they, where the boreal forest is located. Uh, well, in, in Alaska, in most part of Canada, in Russia, the area which is called Siberia or in Northern Europe. And one of the things that I want to uh, point out from here is that humans are using the boreal forest quite different in different countries. For example, in Russia or in Canada, most of the forests belong to the government, which means that they are public. And there are also very extensive regions that are unmanaged. We're many in Finland, um, the, uh, most of the forests belong to families. And uh, so they are like privately owned and they are quite intensively managed. Boreal forests are very important for, for biodiversity. There are like many plants and species that are dependent on this forest. And I have just chosen a couple of uh, very emblematic Finnish species, which is like the flying squirrel and the copper is like this, this uh, burst down. But they're not only important for biodiversity, but they're also very important for human well-being. And one of the most important um, uh, benefits that we get from the forest is that uh, they are helping to regulate the climate. I guess that you are all aware that climate change is one really big threat nowadays. And boreal forest uh, or the forest in general, they are like a sequestering from the atmosphere, the greenhouse the greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, and they're releasing oxygen back to the atmosphere. So they're purifying and helping to control the temperatures down. And carb uh, boreal forest is the forest type that is helping, uh, they are storing more amount of carbon. It's uh, storing around like 30% of the terrestrial carbon. And in comparison, for example, with the tropical forest, the boreal forest, uh, or most of the, this carbon, is stored in the in the soils. Boreal forests are also very important for the economy. They provide around forty five percent of all the growing stocks from the world. And with this, they are like many products that you can have, like from toilet paper to um, constructing uh, buildings or like biofuels, which are growing quite much in the late uh, decades and they're used for producing energy and for running cars. And they also provide food, they, for example, um, like mushrooms and blueberries, which are really delicious and tasty. And here's a picture 
of me in the, a national park quite close to, to Yubascula, and I'm holding a Boletus edulis, which is one of the most delicious mushrooms that you can find in Finland. And I want to talk that like Finland, in here in Finland, these uh, goods are not only economically important, but are also very important from the cultural point of view, because um, there is like very Finnish tradition to go to the to the forest and, and pick these these goods. And there's thanks to the every man's right in the whole Scandinavia or so in Norway, Sweden and Finland, you can go to any forest to pick up these goods. So even if it's a private forest, you are still allowed to go there and pick pick them up. There are also many recreational activities that you can do there. Uh, here's a picture also from me, like cross-country skiing in a beautiful forest close to the city center. It's only like 15 minutes away, uh, but you can do many other activities like hiking and you can like, it's very popular to go running or uh, cycling and or bear watching. Um, but yeah, there are like many threats that they're like uh, facing the, the boreal forest. Uh, like, for example, is the forest type, which is warming fast, uh, which is warming faster. And it, the climate change is also expecting to increase the risk of pest outbreaks, like from be bark beetles. Here's like a picture how the forest looked like after being uh, infested. And it's also expected that the climate change is increasing the frequency and intensity of both wildfires and wind throws. And um, so they will become much more, uh, yeah, they, they will happen much more, and then they will destroy, devastate uh, quite big extensions. And uh, I think in Canada, the, the wildfires has been quite a, quite a bit of a problem. In Finland, it's not, because as I said, it's very intensely managed. So there are like many uh, forest roads and people are able to arrive quite fast to, to extinguish the, the fire, but wind throws are becoming more of a problem here. And actually wildfire, for example, it was a uh, last year, the last summer there was a quite big wildfire in, in, in Sweden. And now we'll talk a little bit about Finland case study. And uh, Finland is the most forested country in Europe. About 80% of its terrestrial surface is covered by forests. So when you come here and you go by the train or you are just in forests and lakes and forests and lakes. And uh, so you will just think that, okay, there's not a problem with, you know, you have so much forest, but the problem is that there's quite much slope or there's like very little protection of this forest. And this is especially a problem in the Southern part of the country where the most of the population is living. So close to Helsinki, uh, there the protection of the forest is only around 3%. And in this cartoon, I just wanted to, well, it's just like, a, well, they have been like a maybe a really nice tree and then they have cut it down and the flying squirrel and the woodpecker, which are dependent on this old growth forest, they cannot, they're trying to find a new place to live, a new home, but they really quite hard because there's not that much left anymore. So yeah, we are, as I'm saying, we are focusing in, in management because yeah, there's not that many forests in, in national parks or, or protected. And for many decades in Finland, uh, there has been the clear cut forestry, which means they're like coming I mean, the big machines, they are like taking all away all the all the trees, and then the the forests start to develop again, like this, yeah, they're like uh, planting again, and then when they're mature around 60 to 90 years, they clear cut again. But of course, when you have big areas of clear cut, the whole habitat for the species is completely destroyed. So we, in our team, and uh, there's quite much, we are trying to come out with a new, or actually from the policy also, uh, the, the politicians are and managers are trying to come up with alternative forest management that will uh, also be good for you know the species or for these other benefits that I mentioned before. And continuous cover forestry is one of these uh, alternatives, and it means that they they are visiting the forest more often, not and they are just extracting the bigger trees out of it. It's just called uh, thinning from above. And this is yeah, kind of the type of problems that we are dealing. For example, we are putting different scenarios. What, what can we have? 
In this scenario, we have a forest with many tree species, many type of tree species. They are of different ages uh, and because it's quite diverse uh, forest, they have a very diverse structure. They are good for storing the carbon and they are providing many mushrooms and bilberries and it's also good for woodpecker. Uh, this is will be like a scenario where we have a full protection of the forest. Then we have a scenario where we just uh, have just taken part of the timber. So we have just managed uh, in an extensive way the forest and we still have quite many trees. So we have timber, we have money, but we still have some carbon and, and mushrooms and berries. And this is when what happens when we have a very intense um, management. We have a lot of timber, but we have, yeah, we, we don't have maybe, we have a, a problem because we have lost many of the other benefits that the forests are providing. So yeah, this is kind of the type of questions that we are working here is like a, how to manage forests in a sustainable way. We have now most of the forest is just focused on the economy. Uh, most of the forest owners are and state also because they're like some forest state, uh, they are just focusing on uh, maximizing the amount of timber structure, but we are looking uh, with uh, how to balance this. We are trying to look for optimal solutions and it's good for the society in general and especially also for the for the biodiversity. And how we do it, we this is how a normal day looks like for me and uh, working with, uh, we work with forest growth simulators. We simulate this. We have many management regimes, maybe like around two different alternatives. And we run the simulation into the future, 100 years. And then we evaluate how this different type of management affects uh, the, the different benefits and, and, and yeah, and the species, if it, they can still have their habitat or not, and how to find this good solution for everyone. Um, uh, yeah, even if I'm working with the, with the computer, I spend quite much time outside. So I'm not disconnected to the forest here in Finland. Forest is everywhere. And just to finalize that, like being in science, it like also involves many other type of activities like we have been organizing here last year a really big uh, conference of conservation like around 800 people came to Ubascula to discuss about conservation issues uh, teaching courses supervising the students and here is a picture with my really good friend and colleague uh, Alejandra in 2017 we were organizing a symposium in the, the Netherlands and it was really like a lot of fun so just to give an idea what is what every day looks like. And I think that's everything that I have for now. So I'm looking forward for your questions. And Well, thank you so, so much, Maria, for a fantastic presentation, diving us in the boreal forest. So in addition to our two classes live, uh, Ms. Gress, you guys are typing in questions. That's fantastic. We've got Ms. Ansari's class, grade six, is joining us in Branton, Ontario. So if you guys want to type questions in the YouTube chat bar, that would be fantastic. Um, but yeah, let's dive in. So one of the first questions we're getting from Ms. Gress's class before we go to Mr. Duggan's is, uh, how fast is a wind throw and what causes a wind throw, if you can tell us, uh, Maria? Well, here, the thing is that uh, is huh, actually, the problem is like in the metric system, because I don't know how to, uh, like for example, here, a wind throw, it could be around 16 uh, meters per second, can already be, in, uh, starting to uproot the, the, the trees. Uh, spruces are more vulnerable to wind throats because they have a um, root system that is more swallowed. They are not that grounded. And also one of the things that is affecting the, the wind throw, a uh, vulnerability, uh, if you know it will be affected, um, is that in Finland, and I guess like in Canada as well, the when there's ice, when it's like a, the winter and it's covered by ice, the, there's like it's more difficult to wind, you know, to to uproot a, a tree. But yeah. nowadays, when they, we are having these mild winters and then there's like the short, the the soil is not covered, then it's they're like more vulnerable. And 
I don't know what is like really causing this. Uh, to be honest, I don't know the physics behind the really the wind throws, but here in Finland, usually the most severe wind throws are around autumn. Perfect. It's not my, it's not in no, my that's... expertise that much, but we are having a master student now working on that. Yeah. Um, if you want to come out of screen share, actually, so we can see you again, that would be lovely. So if you click the exit screen share oh, button. Sorry. Oh, no, no, take your time. Yeah. Um, a quick question, uh, so, actually. You mentioned... So uh, do I just take the presentation down or how? Yeah, you just press, there should be a red button at the very top of your screen. If you click that, it should bring you right out of screen share. Yes, yeah, stop, sir. Yep, perfect. Okay. Um, perfect. Okay. You're you actually, yes. I, I just want to follow up quickly. You mentioned... Uh, you know, milder winters there in Finland. Is this something that we're seeing is affecting boreal forest around the world, uh, climate change and, and milder winters in general? That, sorry, I couldn't hear the... Yeah, the question is, you talked about milder winters there in Finland. Now, yes. are these really affecting the boreal forest in a number of ways? Is this climate change, uh, you know, causing a, a big change that you've, you've seen and, and witnessed in your research? Yeah, well, we are, as I'm saying, like the the like the effect of climate change is, is more like severe towards the poles. As you, uh, I think that it's having like quite in the news nowadays that the Antarctica has reached this 20 degrees or over part the 20 degrees. So it's a bit uh, like a rising, like more like nowadays. The only problem is that I think the most devastating effects of climate change are when are some uh, like really some punctual events, for example, if the temperature is rising really much and these kind of things. But when we have we have like a scenarios of climate change into the future from the IPCC, and uh, these are more like average uh, temperatures and how in our work, how climate change, besides these disturbances, how we are looking at it is like a, how it affects the growth of the forest. I don't know if I have answered that much to your question, but... Uh, that's fine. That's fantastic. Okay. Always nice hearing <laughs> the people that are doing their the research. Um, I'm going to take a quick YouTube question, then we'll come to Mr. Duggins, actually. So, Mr. Okay. first class wanted to ask, which region in the world cuts the most trees? Where are we losing the most forest? Losing? That's a very good question. I would also like to, to know it. I would say that uh, deforestation is more important in tropical forest as there's like a transformation forest from to palm oil like a palm plantation or palm oil plantation or these kind of things or like we have all seen like in brazil there are like a, a lot of fires and they're like a tr transforming to agriculture so there in those regions maybe in tropical regions there's the highest amount of deforestation and losing trees but in the boreal forest we are the management is quite intense and it's also affecting negatively to the species and to the carbon that we are storing and to the... So wherever we're losing forests, it's impacting the ecosystems, but in tropical forests particularly, we're seeing a big loss of them and it's having profound effects. Yes, I would say yeah. that this, those are transforming maybe to agriculture, where in boreal forests, we still keep the forest. Fantastic. Yes, looser, poor, you know. Yeah. Uh, let's head to Mr. Duggan's class. If you guys have a question, come on up. Oh, yo. Um, hey. In Finland, do they have like specific? In Finland, do they have like specific zones where they cut down forests and like add them to the economy and areas that are just completely controlled by wildlife? Yeah. So, Maria, do they have places in Finland where they've like just entirely protected forests? They leave it for wildlife only versus places where they use it for just the economy, where they just chop down forests for for us. Yes, yes, there's like a, there's like a, in the north of Finland, there's quite really big uh, protected areas okay. uh, in whole of Lapland. And yeah, and there's still also like, because they belong to the forest, uh, to, there are like many families, they, the forest belong to the family. So there's also some families that maybe they want just to, to conserve the, the forest. Fantastic. And there are like some programs of the government to try to promote this forest conservation. Yeah. Um, I, this is a question from a grade five group, uh, Ms. Gross's class. They wanted to know about tall trees in Finland, old trees, like how big are the trees getting in these forests? How, you, how big? Yeah, how big and how old? Oh, well, yeah, there's some saying, there's not that 
many really big trees. They are growing quite slow in comparison. I'm coming from Spain and they the trees grow much faster. Uh, I actually spent also one one uh, month in, in, in the US and the trees there were much bigger. I don't know. I, I think they are considered maybe like 130 years. They are already really old for Finland. Wow. Okay. Uh, or like 100. Yeah, they could be, of course, 200 years, but they're not that many. And so, yes, yeah, because it's colder, because it's higher up, we've got trees that are fairly Yeah, it, they grow tree. quite. Yeah, as I'm saying, you are here, you can see there's full of forest that they, most of these trees are quite thin. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, Maria. Um, question from a group online. Uh, what is the climate like in the boreal forest from a Sansari class? Well, the climate is quite cold. And uh, yeah, I was just also saying like uh, in the north of Lambla, but it's the same, I don't know what is in Fahrenheit, but it could be minus 50 degrees, like in the cold winters. Wow. And it's like really dark in the winters. And, uh, but then like during the summer, like the, it's quite amazing actually here, like in the spring, it just comes, the, the, all the lakes are completely frozen. And then like, uh, it just comes, they start to, to melt in April, and then in May you have this really explosion, really, really fast. The trees are growing really fast, and, and then you have a short spring and really short summer, which is really beautiful, and then, yeah, very long winters. But as I'm saying, the boreal forest is so big that I guess the conditions are varying a bit. It's quite harsh. Yeah. Well, I mean, just by comparison, so for our Kansas class, it's totally different outside of your realm of expertise. For the Toronto class, like where she is in Finland right now is about the same level that Whitehorse or Yellowknife are in Canada. So if you can picture that far north, uh, it's a very, very yeah, different. Yeah, um, Yubasco is 62 degrees north and yeah. Alaska is 64. So we are quite north. The only thing that because of the, uh, the circulation, so in this part is much like the conditions are not as cold as that part of Canada in general. And we have less, usually less snow than there, like in Canada, the, the amount of snow is a bit less. Fantastic. Um, let's go to Mr. Duggan's class again. If you guys have a second question, come on. What are some alternatives to clear cutting? What are some alternatives to clear cutting, Maria? Well, you can, for example, extend when you cut the trees. They are usually, as I said, cut maybe 60, 90 years. So you can extend, you can cut them 10 years later, 30 years later, and this is helping the carbon. You can also have, as I'm saying, instead of cutting them all at the same time, you can just take a few of the bigger trees. You can also, when you are cutting them all, uh, you can, usually they are living only five trees per hectare. So you can increase that amount. You can leave 30 trees per hectare. And so, and like that, quite many, I don't know if you know what is thinning, but they're like just extracting few of the smaller trees. So you can have thinnings or no thinnings. And we are looking at all these changes in management and how, then how many kilograms of bilberries we get, how many kilograms of mushrooms we are getting. And we are like playing all this with this, optimal optimization and things like that. Yeah. So how do you do that? I mean, if you have a tract of forest where you're, you're implementing these management strategies, you must have many different large tracts of forest to see how certain changes, you know, influence the ecosystem. So where are you doing this? Is this just around the university? Is there a special area yeah. of forest just for you? Like what's going on? I would love to say that I'm going to the forest and I'm measuring the trees myself and these, these, these kind of things, but actually, uh, Finland has amazingly amount of open data. So we have, uh, there's free web pages and there's the Metsan, which is like the forest center of Finland. And you have actually for the whole of Finland, uh, all the forest stands uh, and you get that information. So we just download it in our computers and then we can just simulate the data. Okay. Uh, so it actually it's available, freely available for the whole of Finland. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take two more questions from our groups. This has been great. Uh, Ms. Gross's class wanted to ask, this is something that's been in, in a lot of forestry discussions lately. Can trees ever stop growing but keep living? Do they just stop at one point and then continue to live or not? Yeah, actually that's, uh, as you said, it's really in the forestry debate. 
uh, the pro or a little bit is a bit harder to study because so I'm saying these forest growth simulators are designed for managed forests, and there's not that much study about really all growth forest. I would say that forests or trees slow down their uh, growth, but I'm not sure that they really completely stop growing. And also one important thing that is in the, with this climate, climate regulation is that the forests still are able to store its amount, a really large, large amount of uh, carbon also in the soil and in their tissues. So. Yeah, I'd really recommend certainly the older classes that are watching. Uh, the Hidden Life of Trees is a book that has came out in the recent years and is a really, really fantastic resource for learning about some of the most you know cutting edge things that we're learning in forestry. Um, we'll take one last question to Mr. Duggan's class. If you guys want to come back up one more time, go for it. Adriana, what's up? What are your plans for what? Can you just repeat that, Mr. Duggan? Your plans for the next 10 years. Oh, plans for the next 10 years, Maria. No pressure. <laughs> year. Wow. Wow. You said it like three next years or something like that. That's well, uh, I have been like a postdoc or like a, you know, I think it's really hard to find a permanent position in science. So let's see what happens. So far, I have my own project for the next three years. Uh, I will funded by Kone. And so, and like, as I said, like collaboration are really important. So we are all the time writing applications and trying to get more funding. So actually we are waiting for a couple of decisions. And if those decisions are positive, I will hopefully able to work a little bit longer. And then I don't know. I mean, I would really like to continue doing things about conservation. I hopefully, like in science, I really like teaching and I really like to study these kind of things. But let's see what happens. It's not entirely on my side. We will come back and check in with you in 2030 and see what's going on. Um, yes. A quick follow up. Are you keen to continue being in Finland or would you like to learn about forests in other parts of the world? Yeah, actually, I would really like to learn about other parts of the world so hopefully okay. maybe we will have some collaboration also we will join you in I brazil can... in 2030 we're very excited um <laughs> maria thank you so so much for joining us today um what we do thank at the end of the session i'm going to demute mr duggan's microphones so if you guys could say a big thank you to maria for joining us all the way in finland mr duggan's class thank you, thank you very much Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And Maria, we really appreciate you being here for now, guys. Have a